Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Decibel Dialogue. I'm Judy Maggio, and we have two very special guests with us today uh, because a big event is coming up on PBS starting on September 15th. It is a premiere of director Ken Burns' country music documentary, and we have Dayton Duncan and Julie Dunphy, who are the co-producers of this film, and it's, we, it's more than a film. It's, what, eight parts? Yeah, it's a series. It's a series. Eight, eight, eight episodes. Eight episodes. Sixteen and a half hours. Sixteen and a half <laughs> hours. All right, I want to I want to talk more about the making of this film, but first I wanted you two to go up and see Studio Six A, the original Austin City Limits uh, studio, because I know it's it's prominently featured many times in the film. Any reaction to your little tour? <laughs> Well, thank you for checking that off my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real thrill, and I can now send it to all my UT and Texas friends, that picture. Um, well, you know, in making this film, um, we've traveled to uh, <clears throat> Bristol, Tennessee, where the great recordings were made oh, of right. Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family. We've been on the stage of the Ryman Auditorium. We visited Sun Studios in Memphis where Rockabilly was born out of country music and rhythm and, and blues. We showed excerpts of the film at, at uh, San Quentin Prison where oh, Johnny Cash right. performed to the in, and one of the inmates there was Merle Haggard. Wow. Now being, on the, being able to stand on the stage of Austin City Limits of what I used to watch um, was a great thrill and it was a uh, for many years, I thought it was an outdoor venue. That was, many I was people so gullible do. for that. No, but, you're not but, gullible. Everybody thinks it music. was outside. And, and we use a lot of footage from Austin City Limits uh, in our film because it was such a it was it's such a great program. And for our purposes, if we're talking about whether it's the Judds or Kathy Matea or some guy named Nelson. Yeah, uh, I think he might have know, been on one of the yeah, first, or the first one. The first one, one yeah. yeah. And it, for us to tell those stories and be able to have musicians singing the songs that we're highlighting, it's just a great thrill. We collected over 800 hours of archival footage, footage a lot of which is performances. And I think if you know what you're looking for, you will see ACL scattered well, throughout the series. Well, we're delighted to hear <laughs> that. And, and, Bringing everything full circle, tonight there's an event at the new home of Austin City Limits Moody Theater uh, where we're going to be premiering uh, a shorter version of country music. So before we talk more with these wonderful producers, we want to show just a short clip of what you can expect starting on September the 15th. It's about the melody and the sound and the voice and the sincerity of it. From director Ken Burns. Country music is truth-telling. It's everything. Hillbilly, it's blues, it's jazz. You can dance to it, you can cry to it. The people who built this country, that's where country and blues come from. It has something in it for everybody. Country music comes from right in here. This heart and soul that we all have. Country music, Sunday, September 15th at 8, 7 central, only on PBS. I love it when Garth Brooks talk about, talks about country music coming from your heart. Um, and then I, I've heard another phrase, uh, two chords in the truth. Three chords, <laughs> three, three chords in the truth, yeah. okay. Yeah, that was uh, um, Harlan Howard, a great country songwriter. That's how he defined it. And, uh, and we use that in our introduction, crediting him as saying it. But I think what our series shows is that there's an accuracy to that. The three chords, meaning there is a melodic simplicity oftentimes to country music, but the truth, there ain't nothing simple about the truth. And so the, it's that combination of, on the one hand, people sort of used to denigrate country music that it's just sort of, I don't know, simple. Mm -hmm. uh, but that melodic simplicity is the delivery package of things that deal with the things that come right from your heart, you know, mm -hmm. loss and love, Failure, redemption, uh, alcoholism. You know, alcoholism. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As one, some, some one person said, you got to throw in their murder and suicide and all these <laughs> other things too. And and but that's what it is. And our, what our film, I think, demonstrates is that country music is not what many people think it is. Whether they love it or not, many people think country music is this. And what we show is that it's this in terms of many different styles of music that all are under the umbrella of country music. Well, I know that... Uh, well, I would just add that melodic simplicity is 
joined with beautiful poetry. Mm. It's lyric-driven dr music, and that, that combination is the delivery system mm. that goes right to your heart to deal with these elemental emotions that, that Dayton was referring to. You know, when I interviewed Ken Burns about the Vietnam War documentary, he, he likes to use that quote from Mark Twain about, <laughs> what is it, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he said that, you know, he's in the business of rhyming. And I thought, well, talk about <laughs> rhyming. This topic is perfect for Ken Burns to direct. Yeah. But one of the things I wanted to ask you about was how country music kind of reflects our nation's history for good and bad. I mean, you know, the, this, is a, this is a genre that really does get to the, the heart of things, and sometimes that's not a pleasant I'll task. let the, I think the writer of the series should, should yes. answer that. Well, <laughs> it reflects us because it came from us, meaning all of us, right? It, again, it, there's stereotypes about country music, the sort of, quote, pure country music is just white music for white people, mm. most of them males. And that, as, as we learned in looking into its history, was never true at the start and still isn't true. But all of those complications of the rub, as we entitled our first episode, between races and cultures in the United States, which sometimes result in terrible things, also that rub of cultures and races can create beauty as well in terms of the mix and mingle of musical styles that gave rise to, you know, to country music. And so it, that's always part of it. And as we follow the music through the course of the 20th century, we're also following the 20th century in terms of American history. But our focus is on how do the songs of country music and the industry of country music both reflect what's going on and also how is it affecting other music and musics and, and other things as well. So where do you start with a project like this, Julie? Well, the narrative begins in episode It's been a million different. When the new medium of radio, um, the new technology of radio, began spreading music that had been sung in farm fields and on back porches and in railroad yards, now was spreading, had the ability to spread across the country, and it was also being recorded on, by phono on phonographs. Uh, you know, that was an older technology, sure. but now um, hillbilly, hillbilly music was also being recorded. You know, there, several genres had already been captured on phonograph records. And so the, the, our story, our narrative starts there, but then we go back and do some table setting. What are the roots of this music? You know, we go back to Africa, we go to Europe. Um, all, and we, so we, we backtrack a little, but the starting point is really the 1920s for both the, rec the beginning of the industry as we came to call country music. And ending? How did you decide where to end it? Because I think well, that's something that people have been talking about. Yeah. Um, you know, the, first and foremost, um, we deal with history and not journalism. So in order, and the difference between those two things is generally about a generation's worth of time and perspective mm -hmm. to decide what was significant. What are those mm -hmm. things that happened that with you know, a little bit of waiting, you can say, oh, it was that that was important. Or it was, in our case, oh, it was that song that might have changed things. Or it was that artist who pushed country music in a different direction. So we, we end right around 1996. By the time Garth Brooks is broken out and taking country music to, to new levels, uh, a new law uh, uh, permitted radio stations to consolidate, which had the, uh, I think, unintended consequence of shrinking the playlists mm -hmm. uh, of things. Bill Monroe, the patriarch of uh, Bluegrass Dies, and one of our major characters, Johnny Cash, who had earlier in the episode been unceremoniously dropped from his label and given up sort of as a has-been is brought back into a studio by, wait for it, a hip-hop producer by the name of Rick Rubin. Not to, cr not to record a hip-hop record, but to record with just his voice, his guitar, and songs that he thought were important. And that revived his career and helps prove this larger point that country music has not never been just one thing, it's been many things, and it's always incorporating things from other music and all, uh, also affecting other styles of music. We so anyway, that's why we end there. That's why you end with Johnny Cash. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saying, I guess his death is his death. Well then, yeah, it, it, we end in 1996, but then as we're telling the story of his sort right. of redemption, mm -hmm. if you will, 
once we're that close to his death, we creep over the border into the 21st century okay. and, and, and note his death. I want to show a little behind the scenes footage that, that we have that you also graciously provided. And I, I, I want some anecdotes from, from making this masterpiece of a film, of a 16 hour film, 16, <laughs> <laughs> eight part 16 hour series. Highlights, uh, any great stories? I mean, I'm sure you could go on and on about great stories, but any memorable moments that you feel comfortable sharing, maybe highlights or lowlights? Job. Uh -huh. <laughs> it, um, so I guess one highlight for me would be um, the interview with Merle Haggard. Mm -hmm. And I, as, as we did before all our interviews, um, Dayton doesn't write the script until we've done most of the interviews because we're on a journey of discovery. We're not assuming we're experts on the topic. We're trying to discover as we go and we're letting the interviews yield a lot of material to us. So I did my deep dive into Merle's music. I was listening to it as we were preparing for the interview and understanding facts about his life. And But what was really interesting with Merle is um, he really he wanted to start he was such a historian of country music he wanted to talk about jimmy rogers he wanted to talk about bob wills he actually had a story when he was 10 or 11 years old of sneaking out at night and riding his bike and going peeking in at a ballroom to watch bob wills but then being able to talk about him um, and his music and and where where that fits in the history of country music um, He could talk about the Maddox brothers and Rose So before we even got to his career he had provided us with all this incredible um, history seen through his seen through his eyes and that was just such a, a wonderful moment um, And then you get to his story, which is amazing in and of itself and and when I had the pleasure of doing Guy Clark's interview as oh. well and um, being able to, to hear Guy talk about his art and the difference between being an artist and um, being a star and what that was like in his career was just, it was a gift. Yeah. Uh, well, you should say, and probably one of the low spots is Julie was in charge of clearing all the music rights of 584 oh gosh. pieces of music. With several other people. I hope that you had a large team helping We did have a large team. So, yeah. so that's part of the, you know, the background of, 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 of producing something of this magnitude is all those details that have to be attended to. Um, you know, for me, it was, uh, as I started off on the uh, journey of trying to prepare to write a script, doing the interviews was always a, a joy. I mean, sometimes we had to chase uh, Willie Nelson for uh, almost two years of trying to get his <laughs> schedule to coincide with ours. Just outside the door of the yeah. bus and not. Well, we ended up, we ended <laughs> up interviewing him on the bus yes, in Washington, yeah. D.C. the same day that he just got the Gershwin Prize oh, from the Library of Congress. perfect. Yeah. So we knew he was going to be in one place for a while and we could maybe... Uh, catch him before he was, if I can use the phrase, on the road again. <laughs> uh, but I think for me it was how welcoming the people were that we, you know, approached to interview or to sit down. I had people like um, Vince Gill, Kathy Matea, Roseanne Cash, Marty Stewart, Catch Secor, Dwight Yoakam, others uh, at the start of the project who gave me a couple of hours time and I would say here's what I'm thinking right now of where we'll break out on, in each episode and the main stories and stuff am I going in the right direction and everything and they would say well this is good but I think you don't forget this or, or that and um, you know they're busy people uh, but the uh, they honored us um, in the way that they you know, made time to help mm -hmm. us do it as, as, as well as we could. And I think they understood that we didn't come into this with a presupposition or presumption of what we thought the story was. We wanted it, the story to tell us what it is and the music to speak to us and that we were willing to take the time. Roseanne Cash is likewise. And they trusted us uh, at the same time that they were helping mm -hmm. us, that if they gave us that time that we were serious about wanting to do as good a job as we could. And talk about country royalty. I know we're running out of time and you guys have a busy evening ahead, but my, my final question is, what would you like people to come away with after watching this series on country music? 
Well, I think the larger point Dayton has made is that country music is not one thing. It has a very, very large embrace. And, and I boil that down a little simply that there is a song or an artist in there for everybody. I don't know which one it will be for you. It's probably different for probably me. Probably more than one for me. <laughs> well, and, um, and there's something that will, will really touch your heart and speak to your life. Mm. Dayton. Yeah, this is, a, this is a, a film about an American art form, musical art form, but it is told by populating it with the remarkable artists who created that art, who have just sometimes such moments in their lives that if I were a fiction writer and tried to put that in a book, <laughs> I would be laughed out of the room. Um, but so I hope what they that people get out of it is that they're these incredible artists creating this incredible art form and as Julie mentioned that it's you know regardless whether you go into it thinking I love country music but because it's this or I hate country music because it's this is what way you'll understand is that it is much broader of that it's part of the American experience and this great mix you know, Americans are not pure, and there is no, therefore, pure country music. It's part of this great mix of cultures and races and everything else that make us, this, you know, the nation we are. The other thing I just sort of say, and if you're pissed off about <laughs> your favorite artist is not in the film, I will contact me and I'll give you Ken's uh, <laughs> phone number and you can call and complain to him. <laughs> Because that will happen. <laughs> Dayton Duncan, Julie Duffy, uh, producer and co-producer of country music. I, I love the compliment that Roseanne Cash gave you all uh, after watching. She said you connected all the dots. That's, that's an incredible compliment to documentarians. So we are very excited about September 15th, and I know a lot of viewers are going to be out tonight to, to get the wonderful preview, and we appreciate you giving us your time this afternoon, and I appreciate all of you tuning in for a little while and giving us a bit of your time. So go out and make it a great day. Mm -hmm.